What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to Bra Meets World. When it's Bra Meets World. Your boy Meets World Fun Guys. This is episode 106. I am Siege. I am Tony Curtis. And uh, we got ourselves, a ge- we have a few things. We have one, one of the most iconic episodes. Uh, like the ever most made. iconic. Don't undersell yeah. this, bro. Like this is <laughs> the most iconic episode of the show. Um, and a guest um, uh, returning to the show, fan, friend of the pod, Yasmin. Hi. <laughs> one of our favorites back again. I'm so honored to be back. Thank you guys for having me. You know, I'm just so thrilled to just hang out and fan out. And I have so much to say about this episode. So I am so excited to join Absolutely you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. This episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what's really funny is I found out that this episode uh, and then there was Sean is like, it's voted to be like one of the best episodes of TGIF. Like, like, it's not just like one of the best episodes of Boy Meets World. It's one of the best episodes on TGIF. I, can, <laughs> I, you, I you know what? Just as a person who's been watching every single episode of this show leading up to this, and I think, Siege, you can agree with me that this is the best written episode as far as just like jokes per second. This felt like this a community so episode. Good. Like, it felt like just something like that was just so different from every other episode of the series so far. And I just, Ooh, it's so good. Mm. It's really, really good <laughs> to talk about this episode. And I'm like, I'm just like, I can't wait to get into it. It has so many good references, so many things. Um, so are you guys just, do you want to just dive right Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I want I'm actually kind of curious because Jasmine mentioned that she had a spooky incident that occurred yeah, when she yeah. watched this Jasmine, episode. Okay. okay prepare yourselves. So, okay, so it was probably about, I want to say probably like 10 years ago. Okay, I was re-watching the show on TV. You know, it was on Disney Channel or something, probably before Girl Meets World was happening and they were, you know, playing it ahead of that premiere. Anyways, so I was, I was really into it and I was re-watching the whole thing and I don't know, I missed a couple of episodes and so I, I don't know, I hadn't been recording them. And so I went onto my iTunes and I bought the two episodes. It was two episodes that I had missed. And so I went on iTunes and I, and I bought them. Anyways, so that was that. And then, you know, you guys reached out and you were like, hey, do you wanna come on and talk about this episode? And I was like, of course, for sure. And then I was thinking, you know, like, it like popped into my head. I was like, God, I remember I bought those two episodes. And, you know, I can't remember what they were, but maybe it's one of them. And I looked and it was that episode. I love it. I mean, like, if you're going to buy a Boy Meets World episode, <laughs> you can't go wrong with And Then There Was no. a But it was such a, it was just, it was so random and such a fluke. And like, I feel like I've had, I've had a lot. It's of- serendipitous. Like, you were meant to have it. To be it, was. it was just, <laughs> it was fate. But I mean... I- yeah, it just, it was, it was so funny and so appropriate. And I mean, I've had a lot of like creepy, super mm. things happen <laughs> throughout my life. So like, if, you know, that's the thing, but, but yeah, anyways, that's, I just it, was say, it was fun. For those of those who don't know, I think we talk about this quite a bit, but this episode is actually why we started Bra Meets World. Like we Our were, entire podcast, we, yeah. The, yeah, the, the pilot was just to, him and I talking about this episode. Yeah, we wanted to do a, a, a podcast and we figured like we were throwing ideas and then we just started talking about and then there was Sean and we went on for like an hour, two hours, like something like this, just talking about this episode. And we were like, do we just want to do like a Boy Meets World podcast? Yeah, because I think we had started talking about like 90s uh, nostalgia stuff. And we were talking about like, uh, like scary, like uh, scary stuff. Like that was like the theme we were like trying to figure out, like scary stuff from the nineties that was spooky. And we started with this episode and we were just like, no, let's scrap that idea and literally just talk about Boy Meets World in its entirety. (laughs) But you know what? I mean, speaking of which though, there are so many, I mean, the nineties was a phenomenal 
phenomenal time for scary movies. Yeah. I mean, every, yes. and plus, I mean, it was really just like such a hallmark of that time and like all the media and all the pop culture, like every show, every like iconic 90s show that we know, they all had those, you know, like cornerstone Halloween episodes. Which yeah. is funny is that this is not a Halloween That's episode. Right. I know we all kind of think of it as one, but this actually aired in like April, I think, originally or something I think it's like, like February. February. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. It, it was such like a weird timing for this episode. It makes sense within the plot of the show. Um, but yeah, definitely not a, a Halloween episode. I'm so excited to like get into this. Um Question T, do you have a, tell me about it. Seth. Oh, yes, I do. <clears throat> tell us about it. There's a killer on the loose. Can he's that fiend, he's that they're trapped inside. But all because Corey made Topanga cry. That Lauren. Very, very good. <laughs> oh, oh, that Lauren. Are we already blaming Lauren? I will not. <laughs> <laughs> we are Lauren apologist on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a collective effort. That was a collective effort. <laughs> I'm so happy. Like, we will get into that. I want to spend, like, an entire section just talking about the Corey and Topanga relationship, like, at where we're at in this timeline, because some things are being said, and I'm like, actually, like, <laughs> we need to, like, really re-examine this. But, okay, thank you. This is season five, episode 16, and then there was Sean. Feeling that Corey and Topanga's breakup is having severe ramifications on his life, Sean instigates a class-wide argument prompting Mr. Feeney to send them all to detention. However, in a parody of Scream, I know what you did last summer, South Park, Scooby-Doo, and then there was none, it soon develops into a detention like no other ever before. And that is our summary. Um, oh my God. Um, I... I'm going to hold off on roll call for just a second, but I would love to get first impressions. Yasmin, you are our guest. Please let us know what you thought about this episode. Okay. Well, first of all, it is obviously a very meta homage to horror films. It is very self-aware. It is, as you just said, filled with amazing 90s references. Like, I was watching this and I made a list of everything and it's just wild. Like there's everything from Archie Comics to South Park to the whole Kenny scenario. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I mean, Young and the Restless, like scream. I, I know what you did. I like, I know what you did last summer. Party of five, you know, I mean, and then even going back a little bit further, there's even a little breakfast club with a whole element. Yes friends in detention and of, of course this is like a psychotic 90s breakfast club thing but first impressions obviously it is so sharply written it is very self-aware it's also you know poking fun of it at itself in a lot of ways um also it is a really pivotal character arc moment for Sean so oh, definitely yeah, like, what's funny is they were able to give Sean depth with this, like, very silly episode, which is why I think it makes it such a like, an iconic episode of television. Because not only do they give us, like, this parody, but they actually, like, the, the final leg of the episode is pretty deep. And it's pretty classic Boy Meets World. So you're like, oh, wow, we were able to do this fun thing, but also give you, like, this self-reflection that, that Boy Meets World is known for. I, I just want to add on to that quickly while we're just kind of giving our, our basic overview statements um, that I, I believe this is probably the funniest episode of the entire series. <laughs> um, I, this episode feels different. Um, one fun fact that I learned from the cast watch of this, which you guys can find on YouTube, which I told my co-host, I discovered 10 minutes before this we started recording, <laughs> so I did not get to watch the whole thing. But this episode wasn't filmed in front of an audience. So they had so much more room to play around. And I think that actually led to a, a better show. Like, I think that fits the series better. Um, and to your point about the meta-ness, uh, it's, it's not even just meta, dude. Because it, it's like, yes, there's this meta self-referential thing that Scream has started, which they're obviously parroting. 
But even within that parody, there's like three other levels of parody of horror as a sub genre of the show inside jokes between the characters like there's all these layers upon layers and I'm watching this episode and I'm having to pause every every other line to be like do i write this down do i am i just writing down the entire script of this episode at this point like yeah where do we start no no, i I, like i i I want to get in there just like re-watching this one first of all like those of you who know i'm such a huge fan of scream um yes i I thought it was like a real it's my favorite movie so this episode does so well at like blending in the meta awareness of scream but also like immediately i was like this does feel different like to your point i was like it feels like we're doing something different the tone of comedy even though it's like um very like it's still written in like the tone that corey would say these things sean would say these things but like the energy, it feels like everyone gets a chance to to shine. Like Angela is like one of my favorite bits of this episode. And, you know, she's just like, she's able to have fun in a way we haven't seen Angela have fun up until this point. Fun fact about Angela, she was pregnant during this episode. She was very, very pregnant. Yeah. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And 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 I love also, you know, there are, yeah, there are so many layers to this episode and you know with the whole horror spoof meta thing you know they you can also really see how the characters are kind of designated to those horror roles too right yes the virgins with uh corey and topanga (laughs) and the little funny moments between you know um eric and and uh eric and jack are like i'd be dead i'd be dead and Sean's like yeah. be as far as you can get without being dead, you know. And it's just, it's 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 so clever. So you have those, and then you know you have the resident scream queen with Angela yes. playing that role, and uh, and she has a great scream. And well, she knows that the screamer, the scream queen, lives, so she's very protective <laughs> of the role. Yes. And then you also have you know Sean as the horror buff, like the the Jamie Kennedy of the scream. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. it's, 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 and then of course, then you have, you know, Jennifer Love Hewitt who comes in and she was that, like that scream queen of that era, you know? It's, yeah, oh I want to talk about roll call really quickly. So in this episode, we get Richard Lee Jackson as Kenny, um, which again, I feel like they named him Kenny just for the South Park joke. 100%. Um, but it's such an iconic, like, I don't know how... Like to me, he feels like Glenn Coco in the sense that he was just given this role, but he does like such a good job in his role. He's iconic in it, and like we just love Kenny for the little bit of screen time that he has. What's what's this? What's this? The actor's name again? Um, Richard Lee Jackson. Okay, so Richard Lee Jackson. So that is the brother of the actor Jonathan Jackson, who is the actor that um plays the guy that. Topanga goes out with in a future episode, uh, but he also is in Tuck Everlasting, if you guys remember that. That's right. I do remember that movie. I saw that movie in the theaters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we watched it in school. A little, uh, I think Rory Gilmore is in that movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, no, totally. I was that's that's a great point. I was going to mention that as well. I noticed that that too because I was like, ah, oh, his uh, Jonathan Jackson, his brother, is a has an important role to play later. He on. is great in this episode. Like the actor who plays Kenny, like he understands the assignment, and you know, there's. Like I was saying how there seems to be like a rhythm to their dialogue in this episode. Like it almost felt musical in the way, like there's this one like moment where um, they're sitting in the classroom in the beginning and he's like, I didn't stab him, he stabbed me. I'd stab myself before I stabbed you. Now, Kenny, give me the pencil. I don't have one. Like it just kind of- (laughs) It's so sharp. It's It's so so sharp. sharp. And he jumps in right in there and he just kind of fits in with it even though he only has a a small role to play he really blends in well with the rest of the cast yeah i kind of like so just because i feel like we're gonna hop all over so i would like to like break it down into three pieces there's before the um murder reveal then we have like the mystery and then we have like the final leg uh and i just want to like so let's start off with like before the murder mystery begins and i think that just talking about TC, you brought up a very good point. 
the Kenny character fits in so well. Like you would not have known that he was just like a once on character because his rhythm, his, hey, it's finger, can I borrow a pencil? Uh, you know, like in the Sean snapping back. And then later on when they're in the kitchen, him just being like, I just wanted a pencil. Like, like, like you know, like that, like it's so good. Um, and then also like, I love that we get this kind of like audience stand in character um like right at the beginning that they like if we want to talk being meta the idea of like oh my god someone's going to die i mean it's not going to be us <laughs> like, I, that's my favorite uh, yeah. joke of the whole thing is uh, yeah. them just being like and we have our obvious first victim why me <laughs> well it's certainly not going to be any of us and they all laugh in a knowing way just being like we're the main characters bro <laughs> like you have no idea <laughs> you're third seat kid you're out of here exactly <laughs> I just love that, you know, they named him Kenny, like, and they're like, just, it, it is just so on the nose with the South Park references. And it's like, in the moment no. too, because South Park yeah. was like in that moment, what's yeah. this, 98? Yeah. It's like season yeah. one or two of South Park. It's like the, the most talked about thing in the like, world right now. Cause I think South Park premiered like mid season replacement. So it was really fresh in that moment, but how weird of a boy meets world episode to make like, a modern reference in that moment. That's something we've never seen before from this show. Like, it's so crazy what they were able to adapt uh, from that meta it's referencing culture thing that they don't really cir circle back to. And it, it fits them so well. It's really funny that you say that because we get like these studio episodes where it's like, uh, what was it, singled out? Or like, we get kind of like these one-offs where there's clearly like a, a, a tie-in, but this, this, felt the most natural way of integrating the current at the time teenage zeitgeist. Like the mention of Young and the Restless, the mention of Party of Five, the mention of uh, South Park, like all of it was in there, but it felt very modern. Feeny saying that he learned about Corey Topanga's breakup by reading Teen Beat. Yeah, Wait, yeah, exactly. What? <laughs> I know I was I was my list of of all of these references is, is like is enormous it's just it's so good and also I feel like I mean it is it is also something that is both very of its time but also I mean like you could all like and of course if you know all of those references like you get it and you appreciate it but also I think the episode is just written in such a fun rhythmic sharp way that I mean you don't even really need to get all of the references to appreciate just what's happening here well yeah i actually like looked up who wrote this episode because i was like this is so well written um and it's written by a guy named jeff minnell i think or jeff minnell um he has written quite a few episodes for boy meets world and a lot of them are like really notable episodes so like I want to give him credit for that but I just thought it was amazing that someone who's been on the staff this entire time was able to like give us this golden nugget of an episode in a way that like honestly feels like it came out of left field like I feel like they kind of took the the reins off of him and just let him write an episode you know yo the character the cast has said that like especially towards like this later part of the show that their season five Friday night 9 30 9 o'clock p.m like at this point no one at the studio was paying attention really like they were just <laughs> like oh do you have the episodes that we need and like maybe you'll get another season maybe like that was just that was their relationship with the show with the network they didn't have a strong following they were never super popular so at this point i think they were just trying new stuff and the cast like on record has said that they all had the most fun filming this episode e even in the little snippet i heard of the cast uh viewing of this episode they said that the crew is getting upset at the cast from the number of times that they broke from just laughing during every single scene that they shot um I'm sorry, CJ. I know we're, try we're 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 jumping all over the place. No, no, no. I get like again, we're we're still in that beginning episode, and this is why I did that because I didn't want it to like constantly go back and forth. Uh, but yeah, like just um again, right before, let's just keep it like before um before Eric and um yeah Eric. well really I guess the conflict starts okay so they're in they're in detention. Gosh, I want to quote, I, I had this episode, by the way, on VHS. It was one of the only episodes I recorded. I, I memorized it. I know this whole episode by heart. They're, they're in detention. 
Sean realizes when he goes to his locker to get his cheese product that they're locked in. <laughs> that they're locked in, which is against the Geneva Detention Convention. Um, <laughs> And but then they just start. What's funny about this is like even with that scene, if we want to talk meta awareness, it's this idea of like, wait, why would Feeney do this? And what's funny is, especially the first half, you're going along with the ride because yeah, this is Boy Meets World. Feeney does outlandish things to teach the boys lessons. Yeah. So like, it's not implausible that Feeney would be doing this. It's um like it's a weird tone, but like, oh, Feeney's trying to teach us a lesson. What's the lesson? Pay attention or die. You know, like it's it's those things where you're still hitting these Boy Meets World beats, but in a way that like also is, I don't know, Halloween episode alt world. Yeah, totally. I, I think there's an interesting moment too, where Sean makes this sort of preface to, you know, the end. In the, right in the beginning, where he sits between Corey and Topanga, and he says, I'm just between you, I'm not in the middle. And that yes. kind of like, plants mm. that little seed, you know, of what, um, which I thought was really, really, really yeah. clever. Yes, I mean, you bring up a great point of how the show like is having fun with all of this like reference stuff. It's playing around with all this meta humor, but at the same time, it's still tr saying so true to the characters and where we are at this point in the series like Corey and Topanga just broke up like officially like the cat like everyone should be heartbroken by this this should be a super bummer episode but the show just has so much fun with the way it explores Sean's fear of them well, breaking up in the beginning Sean's like I feel like this is affecting everyone like like you killed us like this is that, that that's what Sean's saying and like we're in the early part of this so it's like it's a it's dropping those hints of like where we will lead but also it's showing how how much Topanga and Corey's relationship means to Sean yeah. so when we get that third act reveal it actually makes sense because it's been set up yeah. yeah absolutely I think that's also a huge thing especially in terms of of Sean's character development, you know, him saying like, you killed us, you know, so much of his identity is within this little trio, you know, and that, that hopefulness is like the anchor of his life. And he's clinging onto that, you know, if their love is broken, then he's broken too. And then what happens, you know, like what happens to him? I think the most rewarding thing about this from an audience perspective is that exactly what you're saying, his codependency on Corey and Topanga and specifically him like modeling his life at, at you know at, from Corey's life is something that has been written into every season of the show so it's not coming out of nowhere it's actually fits in quite well to the to the psychosis we've already seen of Sean so it's so rewarding from an audience to to see this be the fruition of Sean's nightmare essentially it just being this fun horror movie like the the what Sean would dream about if he fell asleep in class well also what's funny about that is the idea idea that or at least like it kind of has been set up is you again a I just think that we use Angela in a way that we haven't really been using Angela so I love it but like there's a scene where Angela's like yo why is Sean like so obsessed with like your breakup <laughs> Topanga says I, I think he cares more about it than Corey and I yeah. and like again like they they really do set it up that what we're dealing with is not just a breakup we're dealing with a change in the dynamic that we've grown to know and love. Yeah, for sure. And also it reminds me of, you know, this point in our lives that I'm sure everybody has experienced in some capacity, where as we start to come of age and we're figuring out who we are and our, our identity, and we start to kind of separate that from our friends in a way, yeah. you know, or the people who are around us the most. And, you know, you then sort of, apart from those dynamics, apart from who, who you may be with those other people. And, you know, who, who are you truly without all of that, without all, without all of that? And, you know, it can be a scary thing to face and to figure out, especially at that, at that tender age. So I, you know, oh, I just, I just wanted to say, because we're talking about, like, um, they're at this age where all of this kind of, you know, makes sense. I, I just want to say that, to me, these kids seem so old in this episode 
Like, they seem so mature. They seem as though they can stand next to a Jennifer Love Hewitt, and that makes sense. Jennifer Love Hewitt, who we know from being in far more mature content than we've seen these characters display, we are now seeing them integrate more and more mature content so that when they're standing side by side with the Jennifer Love Hewitt, it's not so impossible to think that she could fit into the world of uh, this boy meets world jennifer love hewitt doesn't fit into season two of boy meets world but season five you know whatever this episode and this fits because of the way this show has matured to age with the cast i know jennifer love hewitt and will friedel were dating yeah and we're getting there we're getting there you know, this is <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. don't get me wrong this episode is so good i understand it i just wanted to say right like this i actually want to use this as like a moment to transition to the to the second part which is like the reveal of the blood on the chalkboard that says no one gets out alive and the reason why i wanted to bring that up is because i feel like especially once we learn that this is uh sean's subconscious it's this idea of sean being like oh no one makes it unscathed in love. You know, like, it's like the no one gets out alive is supposed to be like this kind of like tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek horror moment. But in reality, for Sean, no one gets out alive in a relationship. When two people wow. love each other, in reality, it, at some point in time, someone's going to get hurt. And I think that that's really telling. Yeah. Absolutely. I read, um, I think I told you guys uh, before we started recording, I read this oral history about this particular episode. Um, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter, I think, I think. Um, but but yeah, Mike, Michael Jacobs is talking about that, that message, the significance of no one gets out alive, you know, and he was saying, you know, it's Sean wants to know that Corey and Topanga are going to be okay or he's going to burn the world down Ooh. you know wow yeah and so yeah and it is that sort of sort of all or nothing right because Sean does have that part of him in him like you know what I mean he still yeah. is the cherry bomb kid somewhere yeah. deep inside there's just he, the influence of Corey has led him away from that but if his foundation if Corey is falling apart, then he fears that that side could probably reemerge. I mean, I love that we're reading into this because it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's like as, as deep as we're reading into it, it's all there. Like the idea that for Sean, as you say, if he can't have Corey and Topanga, then he'll burn the world down. But like it's more than Corey and Topanga, it's hope. I think Corey and Topanga is hope for him. It's a possibility that someone can find love and that two people who were meant to, for each other can work it out. And so the idea that they can't do this makes Sean just be like, what is the point of anything? Burn it all down. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Okay, moving on. We've just gotten the reveal of no one gets out alive. We just had Sean tell us. Oh, can I say something actually? Because the reveal of no one gets out alive is the first time that we as the audience understand that something surreal is happening in this episode. And I think that the way that they like slowly introduce us into this dream that we don't know we're in versus in like, I, I mean, even in this season alone, we had like a time travel episode that was really dumb. We had like an episode with witches, but everything is like right off the bat. Like, hey, you are in a surreal environment where a, a, the cat from Sabrina is for some reason taking us into the past and this is the world we're going to live in for a half hour. This doesn't have that. This doesn't brace us to like change your thoughts about, you know, the rules of this episode. This is like, no, we're going to convince you this is a normal episode with normal rules. And then much like the way Scream changes the rules of its format, we are going to play around with the rules of ours. And like, you know, it's... It's great. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, people in our chat room said, and I want to make sure, I, I think it's Bur Third City says, I'm 35 and this episode still freaks me out, especially when the song plays through the PA. And that's one thing I will say, yeah. like not only does this episode like do a really good job with comedy, but it's, it's actually pretty scary. Like the first kind of jump scare we get with the uh, killer just running across the screen, it's pretty intense. 
sense. I, I also want to point out that like in this phase of horror, I mean, I am kind of a horror guy yeah. and um, I definitely revisited a lot of late 90s horror this past Halloween season. None of them are particularly scary. Like if you go back and you watch Scream and its sequels, I know what you did last summer's, The Faculty I just rewatched, um, Halloween H2O, like there's jump scares, but they're not really scary. They're more like comedy first horror. And like in that world, this seems very, very fitting like this this fits in very well with that and this feels like like i was watching the faculty the other day and there were scenes that felt like the same energy of this scene i love um, that you said that because i have like when yasmin you were talking about the different references i have like a precursor to the faculty or even final destination like when kenny's like why me i'm not gonna be killed i like i was like oh this feels like like that scene yeah. in final destination right yeah. before someone gets got so uh, yeah this is two years before final destination bro like my itunes <laughs> <laughs> but no also like yes that like to the point too where you're talking about you know about horror and how it's sort of you know it, it's it, it's kind of scary. Also, I think it kind of plays into their, like obviously Sean's fear, but also collectively like that moment where they realize that Feeney is dead. Like they were kind of all, you know, blowing it off in a way, I think before that point. And as soon as that moment happens, like this is real for them. Yeah. Hold on a second. Are we talking about the killing? Cause we have to go back. Cause I have to, say two things about the Kenny death. Um, I didn't realize we were at the death sequences. No, no, we because oh, sorry. I mean, we haven't introduced <laughs> just like, uh, Jack and Eric just yet in this. Okay, episode. okay, okay. I'm okay. oh, sorry, sorry. I, no, no, I was just going to say. <laughs> it's like, hard to hold it back. It's so, again, this episode's so good. Like, I, I completely understand. There's this scene <laughs> where, like, again, Sean is telling everyone the rules of what we're about to see. And we open the door and we finally see that it's Eric and Jack um, have joined. They make up some weird excuse for being there um, that makes no sense. But also I find that really funny because it's like, it gave them a chance to get all of the teenage characters into one space and actually let everyone have fun instead of like doing it with just like the core group and then bringing in the parents and you know this oh my god this i, I love that they brought jack and eric in like they it, it, they're all having so much fun like i feel the fun that they're having just from being together and eric is just like his comedy timing is like Will Friedle in, in general has just become this like fantastically like sharp comedian that you know I've just seen mature throughout the seasons. Um, but in this episode particularly, like he is just the one who is just like the one you can depend on for the laugh, um, and he really just comes through in this horror specific nightmare thing. Like he just fits in really well with it. And also like his vocal work, like he works a lot as a voice actor now, right? Yeah, and you can see like how he shines. I love that you said that because I love that you said it because I was gonna say sometimes the comedy just comes from the way he reads a line. Like yeah. when his entrance is hi, like like that South Park <laughs> reference, amazing. <laughs> but then also like his t comedic timing of um, you know, everything seemed pretty normal. Oh, and blood was coming out of the shines. You know, like like the way that he delivered that line is actually what made it funny and like his kind of like indifference to the really horrific conditions that they're in. Um, yeah, that's what makes Will for the out. Okay, so that moment, okay. So they're talking about the blood in the showers and uh, <laughs> Corey immediately says, how, how was the pressure? Which is one of my favorite <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but so Sean goes into this ongoing this is the first of an ongoing joke of Sean's where like Sean is the Randy and if we're going to scream analogy of this world where he's referencing movies but clearly Boy Meets World's not trying to play pay those royalty checks to reference actual movies so they have to make up movies but they do it in like a really funny way to where sean's just like blood in the showers it's just like that classic horror classic blood in the showers and the audience doesn't really laugh at that first joke like they don't get what's happening it's only until they do it a few times that they start to get the joke and it becomes funnier and funnier and um again just swinging for the fences with the horror not caring if the audience will laugh right away the first time don't have anything else i like I, again i i can go on 
No, no, I, I appreciate you pacing us because like it keeps us from going too far exactly. too fast. Okay, we like blah. Oh, so oh, I, I do have that. one thing. I, the okay. light. <laughs> this is this is my reaction. Keep going. <laughs> When the lights go out, like right before like the whole thing happens, the lights go out and then the we we lights come back on. Eric is in Jack's arms. This is one of my funny <laughs> I, I love this so much. It's so do? funny. He's in Jack's arms, which is funny enough, right? But the follow-up joke that Jack kind of mentions under his breath, which is, did you lose a little weight since the last time you were square scared? Such a funny joke to establish to us that this is not the first time that Eric will jump in Jack's arms. Like this is something that happens all the time with them. Just so funny, all of it. So many f great jokes. I love that too, because it, it just, you know, it like winks to there. They have a special relationship in their own regard. Oh, you know? They do. I was about to say, everyone who's listened knows that I am like in my canon, Jack and Eric are in a relationship. <laughs> maybe it's like just friends with benefit maybe it's like a bro job happening every once in a while but there is something going on there and like this idea of like like there's even a moment later that i was going to bring up where i was like you will have to fight me to convince me otherwise <laughs> yeah they're for sure they're winking to that there's yeah i agree i see it but like mm. right after the lights get turned off two things happen one we get angela screaming again which i love that a little later on, Jack's like, you know, you're really good at that. And she's like, thank you. Like, like, like <laughs> this whole moment. And then um, we get the Kenny death scene. So again, we had our first South Park reference and then we get the, they killed Kenny. Um, we will always remember really? he was this tall. He was again, this like, tall. <laughs> so funny, so funny. <laughs> it's, it's so well written and so funny. Um, I like, again, I'm just telling that joke and it makes me smile so much. Like, I'm just saying like Scream hadn't come out yet. Scream was like, two, I mean, I'm sorry, not Scream, Scary Movie yeah, hadn't scary come movie. out yet. That was like, what, 2000? I think Scary Movie came out. I'm, I'm just saying from just like a parody episode, like it's as good as any parody movie, any like naked gun, like anything of that caliber, like they're hitting it out of the park with these jokes. I mean, I think a testament to that is that how much depth there is because on the surface, like it's fun and it's like campy in a way. And there's all of this, these fun references but then like if you really you know as we're doing you dig deep and you kind of unravel the layers like there is so much substance there and that's what makes it enduring right that's what is that's why it's so good because there's like there is something like beneath that that's it's like the meat is in there <laughs> you know so much meat on the bones yeah yeah really we've talked a lot about scream but i think that um like Kind of from this point on, at least in this middle section, we get a lot of Scooby-Doo references as well. And I think like, like for example, uh, Eric jumping into Jack's arms, uh, we should split up. Um, there's the idea of like, they all do that like shuffle where they're like looking for the killer and like the entire group goes through from one room to the next. Um, and you see like the villain the same way that you would in Scooby-Doo. Like, again, I just think that it's done really fun. And as a huge Scooby-Doo fan, I, I just wanted to call that out. I know we had someone mention this in the uh, chat already, but we're kind of like at that point in the episode. The song that plays over the PA, not only like legit is kind of creepy, but it would stick in, it would get stuck in my head. And like, even to this day, I'll be sh like shampooing my hair and just, here's a knife, here's a gun. Like, it's so catchy. And then there's, I mean, again, how many horror movies that you see have that element to it where there's some creepy song that's always playing before you know shit goes down so good and, that and the telephone like like yeah. when, I think at this point in time the, the telephone rings and we get like oh no no wait this is the moment where feeny appears Oh yeah, Feeny does appear. Okay, and... okay, I do have something to say about that. Okay, so, uh, and maybe you guys can help me with this because Feeny comes up and at this point, do they think that Feeny killed Kenny? Because <laughs> I mean, this that, has always confused me because they don't think like, ah, there's the guy who just killed that dude. Corey immediately goes over and goes, hey, good job on killing Kenny, obvious choice. I mean, the pencil, <laughs> brilliant. Like he's giving him kudos on this murder. So I'm like, does okay. he think Kenny's in on that or? I don't know. I feel like, because they also allude to the janitor 
being the giggles, giggles. <laughs> the yeah. best name for a janitor ever I mean, they allude to, i feel like they allude to him being that like the killer and, and a couple a couple times right maybe they think maybe they think beanie is in cahoots with giggles like and he's just like the ringmaster I think they think it's one of these elaborate Feeny. Yeah, they think that like yeah. giggles and <laughs> I'm sorry. Calling a grown oh, man giggles is so funny. It's like, but I guess it's like a Pennywise thing. I don't know. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be like the irony of it. And then also I think it's like something along like um what happened? Like John Wayne Glacy being like the clown, you know what I Oh like, yeah, yeah, Gacy, yeah. This innocent person actually being more but like also it's so obviously um like not the janitor because he's so menacing oh my god and like honestly i when i used to watch this episode every single time sean would go hey giggles i would always laugh i would always (laughs) laugh oh my gosh so yeah feeny's dead at this point yeah Yeah, feeny's dead they killed feeny uh a great callback reference um, again, this is what everyone like we like we're running searching for exits. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone's trapped inside, um, which I think is really great. And then we get like the phone call episode. Oh, sorry, well, 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 they get to they're, they're starting to wonder. They're like, hey, is anyone safe? And that's when we get the well, virgins never die, which I have so much to talk about. I want to dissect every single part of this joke because it's so brilliant and well written. Because not only does it tell you uh, a lot about like the understanding of where vir- virginity lies within horror, um, the 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 importance of virginity that we've seen placed on specific characters on this particular show. Um, it's such a brilliant way to reveal what each, like where each character is on like that lineup. I just, I love every single part of it. Yeah, I agree with you where it's like, they they immediately give you like this bar and they kind of like let you know who we will like have this journey with later because like immediately Corey goes to Sabina, which I thought was a little fucked up. He was like, thank you for saving me. <laughs> He's like, thanks for saving us. Jack and Eric immediately go, I'm dead. I'm dead. Sean, the best line of any episode. I'll get as sick as you can get without actually dying. So funny. It's so, yeah, I totally agree. It's so brilliantly written. It, that, like, that is, that's gold. Like, that is, yeah. it's so smart. And also, yeah, like you were saying, like, it just also really, like, it highlights that the whole horror tropes of, of virginity and the roles that that plays. And it's just, yeah, it's amazing. I'll get as sick as you can okay. get. That's so funny. And then also, we <laughs> get our Feeny call out. It was like, well, Feeny died. We're like, oh, go Feeny. Go Bella again. Uh, <laughs> things that are very obvious. But I think that for a show like Boy Meets World on a network like ABC at a time like TJIF, it's really, that was a great way to stick that in and like have it be played for fun without making it this huge big deal and making, you know, like parents feel uncomfortable about it. I I also just want to say that like, in terms of this being a nine o'clock show on a Friday night, that like the way that this joke, like, and the way that they're kind of uh, approaching sex within the, this season, especially, is so different than what I've seen on the other shows of this era. And I could be wrong. I'm I am nowhere near as familiar with Step by Step and Full House, uh, you know, as I am with with Boy Meets World, Family Matters. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I remember, but just from watching it live more than watching it in syndication, I don't know that Eddie ever had like a oh, when am I going to do with sex episode on, on Family Matters? I don't know if JT ever went too far with the girl on Step by Step. I just don't even know that those subjects were even approached in the same maturity that they are on this show. And I just really want to give the show credit for that because I don't remember that from anywhere else. And it's important, obviously. I think having those conversations are important, even if it is just these jokes that kind of let us know, well, like, oh, wow, Eric's a lost his virginity something that they've never talked about but they're just letting us know afterwards no i I totally agree um i'm also you know i i feel so close to the show as well and i i I, you know there's other shows that may have approached it in a in a meaningful a thoughtful way too but yeah i i think 
Boy Meets the World was really special in that sense where they did have moments that were, you know, reflective of of what a lot of teenagers were actually going through beyond, you know, I feel like so many of those shows, especially like in that TGIF kind of caliber where they are kind of meant to be skewed a little younger, you know, and there was always kind of a overarching, maybe, you know, morality kind of a thing, you know, which is maybe not always accurate for what people go through, right? And what, what you're going through when you're growing up and you're coming of age and you're exploring different things. And Boy Meets World was really, great about that and I and I think also I think when they had the whole struggle with wanting to um continue girl meets world and do you remember and they were wanting yeah. to go on like I think it was Disney right and and they and yeah. they wanted to push the boundaries as the show had done the original show had done they wanted to explore you know her becoming a woman and be discovering herself because that's that's real right yeah and and the network was like didn't want that I think that show not being moved over to Freeform is like one of the dumbest decisions because like Boy Meets World did grow up with, like we grew up with it. So the audience grew up with the characters and they were able to get these kind of um, moments where, you know, they're talking about virginity in a way that's like, fun but also respectful and realistic I also love one of the things I was going to point out is they completely avoid Angela or Topanga answering that question which like usually right. I'm like oh like the but I was like no that was a smart move because right. you let us know where everyone is without having the girls actually have to like answer that question and face whatever that's right I yeah that's I didn't realize that and that's that's really I feel like that's intentionally respectful on the yes. right part. Exactly. Yeah. Um, another thing that I wanted to speak, like, because well, I, I was like, oh, they knew they knew not to ask Angela that, number one. Also, I think it's really funny that she's pregnant in real life uh, during this episode. Yeah. But then also the idea that I like that what we've seen so far, Angela is given a moment to be vulnerable. Usually Black women are the strong characters. They are, you know, like, like they have to be the best friend and like help everyone fight the demons. But to have Angela be the scream queen and be the one who's just like vulnerable, it, it was like, it's a change of pace. And I thought that was really great. Well, that's what I actually thought that they were commenting on when she was like trying to like keep the scream queen title away from Jennifer Love Hewitt was the sense of like, hey, I've been watching these movies with Sean. I know that black women don't make it very far. <laughs> I'm going to be the scream queen as long as I can. Like, I, I thought that they were kind of playing onto that, but maybe I was just looking a little too deeply into it. I think I, I, I thought the same. I think I think that's a, an accurate uh, uh, observation. For sure. So we've mentioned it a few times, but I think it's time that we talk about Jennifer Love Pfefferman. Yeah. Um, aka Feffy, which again, like I don't even know why, but like the the mere idea that her name would be Jennifer Love Pfefferman, and he was like, I will call you Feffy. Like it's so stupid, but I mean, <laughs> and I like, enjoyed it so much. Also, I mean, I have to say, I don't know why, but like maybe it was a '90s thing, but like that Pfefferman reminded me of like Lisa Kudrow's like phalange kind of thing. I don't know why. It just made me think of it. <laughs> It does have a very like schoolyard, like a name that just kind of sticks with you. Um, yeah, the F, I think. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think, I think what's funny is it's it, like Phalange and Pfefferman, they're both kind of like, they're so absurd that you like their absurdity, like, is like, inherent, but also like everyone buys in. You know what I mean? Like, you're just like, yeah, okay. Like, I don't know. It just, it also felt like too that there were like, hey, we want you to know that this is Jennifer Love Hewitt, but we also like don't want to like commit to that 100%. So we're just going to give you like 60% of the Jennifer Love and we're going to play around with the rest. It just felt like this thing of like, she's, they, they specifically did not give her like, oh, this is Pam. You know, they didn't do that. They didn't give her like a name where she was just a student. They wanted you to know that this is like a movie care, a, 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 essentially a movie character that stumbled onto their set. Well, yeah, there's that whole thing where they're like that really hot chick from Party of Five. Yeah, <laughs> such a great joke too because they're, they're both in it. Yeah, it's yeah, so no, great. It's so good. It's so it's good. So good. Especially when like again, knowing at the time 
that Will Friedle is dating Jennifer Love Hewitt. The fact that he's like, well, obviously. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, it's so fun. And like, it's the levels of self-awareness is um, just phenomenal. I don't know if you, if you, either of you have seen this. I remember, I don't, I think it was in Seventeen magazine or YM or one of those. And like the two of them had this like romantic magazine photo shoot spread. How embarrassing. Oh, wow. No, <laughs> I would I love to that. see it. <laughs> it was like for fall fashion or something. And they're both in, you know, the latest styles and they're just posing in like fields and like doing, <laughs> doing all these romantic things. And it was, it was, it was around that time, right? So I would be so happy to see. It. I'm like, I'm going like, to Oh, I'm Googling this. I can't see it anywhere, but I'm, I'm going to keep a lookout for it because. Oh, I'll find it. Okay, so um, oh, now let's go into, we've just met Jennifer Love Pfefferman. Um, oh, can I just say something about, real fast before we move on? It's just like, right before uh, we, like, Jennifer Love is introduced, like, they're like, Feeney's dead. It's the end of the last of the obvious suspects. The killer is one of us. Like, they keep making these jokes, but basically what they're they're trying to do is they're like, who can this killer be? If it's not one of us, which is like, again, like, a horror conversation if you ever watch uh, john carpenter's the thing a bunch of people uh, in a room looking at each other being like one of us is an alien who is it this is a very classic horror conversation to have who is it amongst us um for a new character to get introduced now all eyes are on jennifer love hewitt it's like oh this new girl just happens to show up right as this killer comes is she it or is she a red herring to the scooby-doo reference like it's just so much fun happening I had a thought um, about her whole role on the show. I don't know if I'm thinking too far into it. Tell me what you think. So I wondered if she sort of represents Lauren. Oh, right? yeah. Right? Because she's this sort of, you know, she's not really part of the group. She's this like fish out of water that randomly comes in. One of the guys is all over her. The girls don't trust her. Like there's that scene in the library, like Topanga's like lurking in the background in the library. I don't trust her as far as I can right? throw her. No, exactly, <laughs> right? So I was like, I wonder if that's, and especially, you know, knowing that this is Sean subconscious, right? He feels like so much guilt about that whole situation that he played a part in this, right? And so I, I, I just, I want, I always wondered, like, if that's like some sort of manifestation of Lauren. great observation. Okay. That's a great. I mean, especially considering they have like, you know, they both brunette around same height, white girls. Like, I can totally see that. Especially as, as you said, I think there are so many things that when you realize that this is Sean's dream, a lot of it makes more sense. Like all of the references, all of like, like it makes sense that this is what Sean's mind would be in as Sean is like clearly a consumer of media uh, uh, at the time. Yes, totally. Okay, so um, we're in the library now. Like, oh, can I just say that one of my favorite jokes in the uh, in the episode is uh, they're like wandering around and they're like, "Oh, I don't, I don't know about this Pfefferman. Everyone's all this stuff." <laughs> Eric says to Jack, "When did the school get a library?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The idea that Eric was there for four years and had no idea that the school had a library just great jokes. And then, yeah, I love how Jack's follow up to that is every day is an adventure, isn't it? Uh, uh, like another yeah, little, little, look this through, a little wink to their relationship. Again, all right, so if we want to talk about like the little like uh, moments in their relationship, there's the idea. Well, first of all, like I also going back to your Lauren thing, which is very interesting. It's the idea that Corey and uh, Fethi go off together, and they're talking. It's just the two, and I thought that that was a weird pairing, just to have Corey okay. with Fethi, because like we've already established that she's connected with Eric and then there's this idea that um you know like maybe she would be with one of the girls but the fact that it's Corey and Feffy shows that there is probably some subconscious and you have Topanga lurking in the background that this is like some substitute for Lauren totally um, and she gives him that kiss on the cheek too it's like that's I'm loving it. Like we're we're, we're that she wrote thing. her own death sentence when she gave him that kiss. Exactly. Who we'll pushed those bucks? <laughs> exactly. The moment that like she kisses Corey, that's her her kiss of death. Then she dies. 
And then uh, Eric and- runs over to try to <laughs> come for her. And she's like, I think I know who the killer is. By the way, I, we didn't mention this, uh, but can we just quickly talk about the fact that when Jennifer Love Hewitt was uh, introduced, she, uh, like, Eric immediately sexually harasses her, right? Yes. Yeah. Right? Is that, yeah. Isn't that what happens? I just, I, I wrote that down and I wanted to circle and I wanted to make sure we talked about that, that he just immediately starts making out with her without consent or anything else other than the, hi, this is my name. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I think like, I, th- I mean, I feel like they, he could do that because they were dating, but like if that, but like outside of that context, yeah, it's not cool. That's not, okay. yeah, no. <laughs> I think they, what they call it in some other room, I, like, like a surprise kiss where it's just like you just go up and you kiss someone unexpectedly um, and I didn't note that but I'm glad that you called it out because yeah you can't just go off kissing people you <laughs> yeah like anyways probably <laughs> She's di- she's dying. Eric's trying to comfort her. Eric's dead. And then we get this really funny moment where Jack is like realizing, oh my gosh, Eric, my friend, my roommate, Fuffy. So this is the part, hold on, hold on, hold on. Know her. this is the part where I was like, okay, so the fact that Jack's like, I don't want to go on living without Eric. Like, I was like, I feel like they put that like, they put that rent line in there, which is hilarious, especially as like, we're all millennials in the idea of ownership or like having anything without roommates is just like highly unlikely. The idea of like, if I have to pay all of the rent, it's not worth living. Uh, <laughs> I thought was hilarious. And follow up, Angela being like, yeah. Jack. Uh, someone is also your roommate together you can pay the rent (laughs) like (laughs) it's so good again like a millennial joke before millennials are even like being defined as a thing but Uh, hilarious you know it's so interesting that you say that like the idea that because i i joked about i wrote it down like oh it's funny, haha, Jack's trying to jump out of a window because he can't afford rent. And obviously there's all those millennial implications, but when you strip that away and you talk about your theory, what was rent really? You know what I mean? <laughs> like was rent, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> rent was a symbolic like, for something he else. Immediately, he doesn't say, oh, there's a killer on the loose. Like they could have said like, he freaked out and there's like too many people are dying. I don't want to be around here. Like there are different ways to get it. It's specifically when, once Eric is gone that he's just like, yeah. is it even worth continuing? And I was like, Ugh! It's interesting I- because this is Sean's subconscious and he is a roommate of Jack and Eric. So something about him has oh. absorbed that there is such a codependency that between them that if one were to die, the other one would kill themselves. That's just in the world we're in right now. And I mean, to that point, I mean, in the, the killer who we will get to who that is gonna be, he then pushes them. I mean, like maybe knowing in his subconscious that he cannot go wow. on without Eric. He's the one wow. who literally pushes them off the roof. I, I, I have a question for you guys. What do you make of Angela getting the push? Well, so I think that what it comes down to, cause I was gonna mention that, which is that um Eric and not Eric um Jack and Angela are the only two left outside of our core three and I think that to Sean like like they think about it like just in terms of closeness to Sean Eric goes first because Eric is Eric and he's like Sean's friend but he's also Corey's brother so it's like twice removed then you get someone like um Jack who is Sean's brother and Angela who is Sean's girlfriend who they're very close to him and they are like his direct link but also they're he hasn't known them as long he doesn't probably trust them as much as he does Corey and Topanga so I think the idea that uh Jack and Angela get pushed or get removed from the situation at the exact same time is very much their level of closeness to Sean. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I totally agree. But then I wonder though, what about Feeney? Because Feeney, I feel like has a very important role in Sean's life as well. 
Yeah. I think that was just like getting rid of like one of the more obvious, uh, you know, like we, we were really talking about like the teenage group here. And then also if we use Jennifer Love Pfefferman as the stand in for Lauren, then that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about all of these teenagers and Sean's understanding of like what just went down. And the what just went down was this strange girl came in like and just disrupted all of it and you know like just slowly pulling back i do think it's interesting though that feeney did die so early because they do seem to die like you said in some kind of level of importance and i i think cj's uh thoughts on that were, were spot on um but i think this also has a lot to do with like the fact that feeney didn't really play a role in what was happening with uh Corey and Topanga he just didn't he very well could have at several times actually he could have stopped the Lauren and Corey thing from happening and did it so uh you know he he got cut out yeah 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 I mean I think it's I think ultimately like this is Corey and Topanga are life and death for Sean right yeah. it, that's 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 it that's well. it's everything hey uh Yasmin how would you feel to have uh uh, th like fourth or third billing in a man's importance <laughs> being in a relationship with them like how should angela feel knowing that like yeah my best friend and his girlfriend are a little bit more important to me than you are like i feel it like she knows though i feel like she knows you know wow. it's the same sort of i guess for Corey and topanga like she knows that she's on par with sean you know well, yeah like, they're so like yeah, no, that's, I think, like, that is, like, they are so intertwined, right? Like, yeah, I think, like, in the very beginning, again, we set it up with the idea that um, Topanga tells Angela, I yeah. think he feels more strongly about this than we do. So it's, like, it's not just that, like, um, and, like, this is more important than Angela. Like, this is more important to Sean than Corey and Topanga. <laughs> like, like, yeah. You're and right. Like, it's so much stuff. bigger than even their relationship. This is about his stability in his life and him having a foundation. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the symbolism, I think, right? Like, it. They, what they represent, they, and they represent stability and they represent hope and they represent all of the good things that could be in the world, according to Sean. Um, yeah. So we just got the reveal that the killer is Sean. And I thought that, A, when I first saw this, it actually was, like, I remember as a kid watching this episode for the very first time and being so confused because, like, we didn't know it's the dream at this point in time, but we do know that it's, like, surreal. So I wasn't really sure what was going on, but, like, I just, like, the emotional weight of the mask reveal is very, like, it's given the moment it's supposed to. I remember being actually quite surprised, like uh, watching this in its first airing. I, you know, you're trying to figure out who the killer is the entire time. I actually thought the killer was going to be Lauren when I originally saw the episode. I did too. Really? I did so too. I, I, I thought them having like two Sean's was like a really smart little play on that whole screen thing of there being two killers, you know, but it's, um, I when I saw it, I thought the killer was going to be Lauren. And I think it also... I mean, I don't think you really, you don't really get it when you're, you know, when we were watching it when we were 10, you know, like you don't, I don't think you fully grasp the weight of like what's really happening here and how, what this is representing and how this is, you know, a moment, a pivotal moment in his life and the reasons why, you know, and I think now as adults and you, and you see that and you see like how brilliant it is and all the little moments throughout that kind of lead to this path at the very end where it comes full circle. And then right from the beginning where he plants those little seeds, you know, and it's just, it's, it's so, so well done. Like it's really brilliantly written. You know, yeah. how great of a like, like how deep of a moment to be like, it's actually you, you're the one who yeah. like, like, you're like my, my own self is the one who's sabotaging uh, this. I'm, I'm the one who yeah. is like actually taking this the hardest and would have the most motivation. Like, I think that that is actually like, as you said, it's a really layered reveal. It's not just like a good selection for storytelling and like a gotcha moment, but like when we actually look at it as like a psychological reflection, 
the idea that they would show that it was Sean and mm-hmm. not Lauren. Actually, it's like, no, Lauren, Lauren has nothing to do with this. It's your perception of these events. Also, yeah. this is really projecting like way ahead, but this becomes a sort of theme in a way for Boy Meets World, right? Like later, later on, when do you remember that episode where Corey and Topanga are like they're about to get married and Corey has the nightmare and he's killed repeatedly uh, yeah, uh, okay <laughs> so yes mean yes I do it I do know the exact episode you're talking about I have actually asked CJ if he wanted me to tell him about no, this and he has no, told me I'm, no I'm several times okay. I'm so sorry <laughs> I'm feigning ignorance I didn't like I but I know exactly you. what okay. you're talking about okay. and yes totally <laughs> okay. but yes that's there like but we'll leave it at the that. death of people is very metaphorical in the dream sequences of, of boy meets world yes um and so then we get our kind of wrap up where sean stands up he's talking about hey i'm the one who's been killing people it's a little weird but to everyone else who like wasn't in the dream they're like what is he talking about but like <laughs> this idea of like him taking ownership over his emotions him and feeney kind of having this moment uh, I do think it's kind of weird, again, going back to it, that Feeney both held everyone back because of like two people's incident and then also lets everyone leave because Sean came to a realization. But that's I mean, but like, like I want to say- Well, if you got- Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Oh, God, good. <laughs> well, okay, no, I, I wrote down, there was like this one moment right in the beginning, where did I put it? Um, where, uh, I can't find it. I, I did write it down. But Feeney, Feeney said something about like, like I'm not gonna let the romantic going ons of two students disrupt like the whole class, and it's like that's so on the nose and self aware because that is what always happens. Right? It always like, happens. That's, well, I really just the only, like people in the class. Nobody I do want to point out that the reason why they they got detention to begin with was because of giggles. Because Feeney said, if there's one more outrageous interruption, you're all getting detention, and then giggles popped up out of nowhere. So that's why they got held back. Um, but Sean actually, during his confession, and in, in, in a display of vulnerability, actually says something, maybe I'm quoting this right, if you two aren't together, then there's nothing I can depend on, which I think is kind of like the whole kit and caboodle of this episode. Um, that's, that's the whole core of it, right? Yeah, that's, that's our episode. That's like the, the one of the best episodes that we can get. And I think now that we've spoken about it, I can see why it's so it's so highly favored because there are layers to it that you can read into it for like such a third, like a 30 minute teen show. This is pretty, this is pretty great. Writing. And, and you know what it's, what's great about this episode is that it kind of has like, um, even outreached the show's central, like, um, demographic. Like I, I, if you just Google and then there was Sean, there's so many articles written about this particular episode. And a lot of them are written by like horror fans, not people who are even necessarily huge boy meets world fans. They just love the scream ish stuff that's going on in this episode. And I think for a lot of people, like this is a great entry point into the show. If sitcoms from the nineties, like if, if this isn't really your thing, you could probably still find some enjoyment if you were to throw this on during Halloween. Totally. I, I pulled up a quote from that oral history I was talking about earlier with the writer uh, Jeff Minnell or, or Menel. Um, and he was saying, you know, before he, you know, he did other episodes for Boy Meets World, but he was doing a freelance writing sort of a thing. And when this episode came about, it was around the time of Scream. And he says, that was the impetus of it. I'm the big film guy of the staff and I love movies. I saw Scream. And the idea came from wanting to do a Halloween show. So, you know, like that was, that was the, that was the root of it, right? Like, and you can see just on how smart it is. You know what? I was going to say that it, like, I know that he's written other episodes, but it does feel like that something about writing this episode lit something within the writer. Like this was just something that you could tell that the writer who wrote this episode is having fun with as well, that he knows all those rules that he can play around with, that it, it makes sense, I guess, for him to be kind of like a, a film buff then. And, yeah, and like he's, he's just, he shines. This is yeah. like, you can see, you can see. This is tied for, uh, with the finale for the top rated episode of the series. It's a really good episode. I'm, yeah. really, really I'm good. not surprised that's, yeah. Okay, um, I will guess I'll get into kind of like our wrap up segment. Uh, does anyone have a bra moment? 
Oh, just the Pfefferman kiss. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a little offside. I had one and it <laughs> goes back to like uh for those like we're currently streaming on uh TikTok. There's this really fun TikTok that I've seen. You guys always know I talk about white boy logic and like this idea of like white boys thinking that the world revolves around them. And in one of these TikToks, it talks about how the only reason why men are in charge is because men are okay with people dying. And there's a line in this where Eric goes, only two people are dead, which is an acceptable Except line. Us. And I was like, that was like, kind of like the point to me where it's just like, yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, people die. It, it happens. <laughs> and just keep strolling right along. I thought that was hilarious. But also kind of like a, we really don't value life in this country at all. <laughs> Feeny lessons? Key I takeaways? I was gonna say, if I had one, I would, I would say, and I don't know, it's kind of like a roundabout way of showing, it's like, you can't put too much expectations on your friends. Mm -hmm. They're still people, they're still human. You, that hope and that um, belief in something more has to live outside of your friends. You know, it's like, it's great to like love them and respect them, but you can't put too much weight on them because they too are human. Like that's kind of like what I took away from it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that's really the, the lesson at the core of this episode here. You know, they're his everything. They are his life and death. And that, and that's, that can't be, that's not healthy. You have to find that strength within yourself. You have to find that individuality within that yourself, you know, beyond what you hold on to for comfort for stability, you know, has to be something outside of that. But yeah, I think that's, I think that's the big lesson for sure. I agree. Codependency, hundred percent. Absolutely. Okay. Grades. What grades will you give this episode? A plus. A plus. Yeah. Absolutely. I was like, I don't think there could be anything less than an A plus. <laughs> like I wrote A plus plus. Like it's so good. Extra credit. Like I don't. <laughs> um, oh, so man. that was our analysis of, and then there was Sean. Um, homework. I will absolutely. Yasmin, is there any uh, thing recommendation or reference that you would like to um, share with our audience? I mean, the whole list of references, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I mean, obvious one is Scream, if you haven't watched it. Um, I know you did last summer. <laughs> I mean, South Park. I mean, there's just, I think to fully get the weight and the beauty and the intricacies of just like all that's in here, you, you got to watch at least, at least some, those two movies and a few episodes of South Park just to get it, I feel like. All right, love it. Love really good. Um, you, you know what? To that point, I I do want to say that this does feel like a '90s time capsule. Like there's yeah. certain things about um every now and then I'll watch something from the '80s that I I can appreciate, but I understand that it's like of a moment that I wasn't there for, and this is a moment that I was there for. As far as just like '97, '98 ingesting pop culture horror movies like i was such a part of this moment that it really is such a great time capsule reflection so yeah you're right all that all that stuff that you said um about ingesting the other culture of that moment will help to appreciate this and also i think that is also just it shows how important pop culture was to millennials growing up i mean really our lives were just so intertwined with it you know it was everywhere and it was everything and it was just it was just so deeply part of our experience growing up and this is this is kind of like the seed yeah. uh, that like like this if you think about this episode as a seed and you think about like shows that followed this the you know the really fast-paced happy ending kubrick town like those you know really smart witty shows community. that community especially oh my gosh the entire series of community feels like a flower that grew from this seed like it, it just really was just such an interesting like i guess almost preview of what the next generation of sitcoms would would inevitably be well i think that we forget that this is like the first 
MTV generation. You know, like, like, like what we're looking at in the 90s, MTV has only been out for like a decade or so. Um, original content is brand new. So the idea that like a an entire generation was watching and consuming the exact same pieces of media. And like, that was like the language language that they spoke with. So that's brand new in the nineties. So, you know, yeah. like, like that's not just MTV, but that, that specific TRL era of MTV, like that specific one where everyone is 3 PM and watching Carson Daly, ingesting every new thing, like yearning for new content every day. Like that's that era that we were in. Yeah, and this idea that like, again, like with the several different references and being meta, like we've watched all of this, a really big part of millennial communication is references. Like, I think like that's why um, Family Guy took off when it did. It was like, because it was like reference and reference and reference. And like, that's how we, that's why meme culture is such a big thing. It's just like, oh, hey, do you remember this one clip of a video from 1992 that's how i feel right now <laughs> so yeah. um uh, t any homework homework um you know i was saying that i got really sick this last week and um within that time i watched that whole beatles doc that's on um cool. disney plus get back it's like six hours long it's very very long and i could see people being very bored by it because it's just a lot of them just like dicking around in the studio um but from just like a pop culture perspective like to know that there's like 4k hd content of the beatles actively creating some of the most memorable music of all time like and then just like paul just like just shitting around on a guitar and then 30 seconds later like an amazing like life-changing song comes out it's just it's a very incredible doc and like if you can appreciate the beatles are are that um era of music at all i think you would really get a kick out of it it's so great uh so it's funny for my homework it's actually a blend between the both of yours which i think is hilarious considering that like we didn't prep for this but i wanted to recommend the movie last night in soho um, which is Ooh. kind of like a murder mystery. It's from Edward, Edward Wright. I believe the guy who did uh, Shaun of the Dead. Um, I want to say Scott Pilgrim, to be wrong there. And then also I know for sure he did Hot Fuzz. Like, so like this director and the whole story is this girl who like um, fantasizes about and um, kind of looks to the 60s music as like the best genre, but she's a modern, like she lives in 2021 or whatever. And then like what happens when she just becomes obsessed and like kind of her world crosses over with this 19, the London in the 1960s versus now. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I saw it. I really enjoyed it. Um, if you like this episode, I think that you'll like it because it's very similar, very referential. Um, very much about just how culture affects us and nostalgia affects us, but also like kind of like this murder mystery and it's really fun. I haven't seen that. I'm gonna make a note of that. that I saw the trailer, it looks very interesting. So I'm, ex I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely recommend. Uh, and like I said, it was like, it's just the perfect, like I had that selected before. So it's great that wow. like we have horror movies in 1960s music. Okay, Look at that, 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 that creepy serendipitous shit, Yasmin, you're bringing to our podcast. I told you, I just <laughs> carry it with me. <laughs> All right, um, Yasmin, um, where can our listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter at Yasmin Shemish and on Instagram, same handle. Love it, love it. Um, and you can find me on um, TikTok or Twitter on I Am Not Your Oreo. You can find us on all the social media platforms at um, Bra Meets World. And T, do you have? Do you want people? finding you where you're at these days. <laughs> you know what i again i i don't really social media much post covid um however i will say that i did set up a discord for brummy's world um i don't know how discord is run but <laughs> if you guys would like to ask us questions and get into the conversation of our episode there is a discord that's set up if you go to the link or in our link tree we have it all set up with our with all of our news channels and everything so um yeah let's get some conversation going i would love to hear what people think about this episode uh especially just because it's such an iconic one that everyone has memories of from their childhood so yeah if you want to um 
get in contact with us, yeah, please go to our Discord and start the conversation. Absolutely. Yasmin, thank you so much for joining. I, as I said, I like knew you were the one. <laughs> Literally, I, I was like, like can Yasmin do it? Because yeah. she's I like... Think- Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm I'm honored. I I was saying earlier, like if we lived in the same city, I feel like we would just be best friends. Just (laughs) at brunch shooting the shit talking about like nothing episodes from random shows from the 80s. I mean, I love it. But yeah, no, thank thank you so much for for having me on the show. I'm I'm honored and this just such a blast as always. So thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Everyone, remember to dream, try, do good. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Later, bruh. Later, bruh. When this boy meets world.